Praise the Lord. Well, I'm really happy to be here with you today, and uh, um, I hadn't touched my guitar in a long time, and I got it out one day, and um, I had written a chorus, just one verse, years ago, and uh, the Lord just added a bunch of verses to it, and it's become a, the, the main song that I sing to the Lord, you know, during the day. The Bible tells us that we can be filled with the Spirit, or be being filled with the Spirit as we sing songs and spiritual songs to the Lord, so I wanted to just uh, sing a little bit of it, and then I'll feed you the words, and you can sing it, uh, sing it with me. Uh, it's called Cast All Your Cares on Jesus from 1 Peter 5, 7, which is what that verse says. And it's got beautiful words, so let's uh, give it a try here. Cast all your cares on Jesus. Cast all your cares on Him. sing another verse in a minute, but, uh, you know, I, last summer my air conditioner went out on my car, and uh, Toyota said it would cost $1,200 to $1,300 to fix it, and that was right at the beginning of August, and uh, I didn't have the money because we were in COVID, and I wasn't traveling and speaking, and, you know, so I'd roll down my windows and breathe all that smoke in, you know, in Eugene, it was just solid smoke, and, uh, I just didn't really cast that care on the Lord right, so I went for a long time without air conditioning. This beginning of this summer, my wife says, you got to get that fixed. You can't go through another summer like that. And take it in, and so I took it in to be examined, and they found a hole in the, in the compressor that was made by a rock, and it was covered by my insurance the whole time. I had to pay a $100 deductible, but that was, that was nothing compared to twelve thirty. And, uh, you know, really, God wants all of our cares. One of these verses, I've got a lot of verses, but it goes, Cast all your cares on Jesus, or I cast my cares on you, for you care for them all, whether large or small. Sing it. For you care for them all, whether large or small. Let's lift our hands up now. Let's do it. Today. I cast my cares on. 
Jesus. Well, let me hear you just lift your voice and bless the Lord and, and uh, make some noise as you praise him today. Would you do that? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Praise the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Father. Thank you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Well, just before we uh, pray over the word... I'll give you a little update to uh, what's been happening in my life and ministry. Um, about three years ago, I was, in the fall, I was in uh, Vermont, and there's some very prophetic people at that church, and uh, I preached uh, the way back to spiritual power uh, because the Lord had been really putting it on my heart that too many churches are content with no demonstration of God's power and that God wasn't getting the proper glory and that uh, we should not be content un unless there's demonstrations of his power. And uh, so then there was a big altar service. There was, it was like Pentecost and everybody was praying, but the lady that was the wife of the main man there prophesied to me and said, God has given you a trumpet. And uh, so when I went home, there, I got up one morning and it just downloaded into me that I was to write a book called Good and Faithful Servant, A Trumpet Call to Return to Spiritual Leadership. I've been in the ministry about 49 years and I've gone to many leadership training seminars and I have a whole shelf full of leadership books. I never bonded very much with very much of the leadership training. Um, and finally, I got so despairing at it, I thought to myself, I must not be a leader. I'm just not a leader. I'll just be a teacher. And finally, the Lord showed me that the reason I didn't bond with it is because the, uh, the majority of leadership training is very secularized. It just takes the Holy Spirit completely out and trains uh, ministers as if they were execs in a corporation. And, uh, uh, and in fact, one of the main books says there's no difference between leading a church or leading a sports team or leading an army. It's, it's all the same. And, uh, and folks, it's not all the same. Can you hear me okay? Mr. Sladnev, all right. So uh, there's major, major differences in spiritual leadership. Uh, and uh, the first thing is you're not the leader. Amen. That's the number one <laughs> law is the Holy Spirit's the leader. And so uh, many of you would think, uh, oh, I'll never be a leader. But how, how would you like to be a good follower? Uh, 
raise your hand, wave your hand, say, I'd like to follow the Holy Spirit, see? All right, so my leadership book is not written to a few uh, key people that think they're going to be big anointed leaders, uh, just fivefold. It's written for the whole body of Christ because, you know, Paul said until we all come to the unity of the faith all to the knowledge of the son of god and all of us become mature attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of christ amen so what um i i'm excited about you and i have a chapter every leadership book has a chapter on vision but uh, my chapter is uh, how the lord taught me that my vision is you when I was a young minister, I'd kind of look over everybody's head, and my vision was out there somewhere, and I'd kind of use people to get to my vision. But one day I said, Lord, what's, uh, you know, what's, uh, what's going to be the biggest achievement, the, the biggest thing I ever do in my life? Will, will my biggest achievement be the church I built or the money I raised for missions or a book that I wrote or, you know, and I named off some things. And I felt like he spoke to me and said, uh, It'll probably be someone you encourage who will do greater things than you'll ever do. <laughs> and that shifted me to where uh, now my vision is, is you, see? Because you might, if I can encourage you, you might go off and do greater things than I'll ever do, and so you are my vision. So when I tell you that I'd like you to get this book, uh, I'm not just trying to sell books. I want to raise up hundreds of, th you know, how can I raise up hundreds of thousands of uh, spiritual leaders? Well, that has to be one at a time, amen? And I'm convinced that anybody that practices the truths in this book will become a spiritual leader. And the definition is uh, those who lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars of the heavens in Daniel. And so if you lead many to righteousness, you're a spiritual leader. You don't have to have a title. You don't have to be a missionary, an apostle, or prophet. Just lead many to righteousness. And I hope you'll all want to do that. So this book would be like me mentoring you, pouring into you all the key lessons of, uh, that God has taught me regarding, you know, being a, a, hopefully a man of God and an anointed servant of God. So uh, this $18, you could buy it online for an e-book for $10. Um, I'd love to have you have a copy of it. Another thing that God's uh, been doing then, and that's made into a course, by the way, so you could teach it with a teacher's guide, student workbook, a DVD download, and, and uh, I'd love to have you one or two of you teach it somewhere amen <laughs> um, this book is the same way it's in a curriculum as well as the heart God hears but we've been getting this into prisons and uh, so far we've got over 6,000 copies of this little book 21 ways to forgive into the prison system if you don't have it, it's, it's five dollars, but you know, um, the things I've been through in my life, I had to, I just had to be a good forgiver, and God taught me 21 actual ways to forgive, and I have to keep using those, amen? <laughs> amen? As long as we live on earth, there's just a lot of opportunity to, uh, to get angry or bitter or get what I call the cousins of unforgiveness are things like sadness, sorrow, victim mentality, amen? And that book, that little book deals with all that. If you buy any two books, we give you a free CD, and I have a couple that I really learned a lot. I studied mercy and justice. Jesus said those were two of the weightier matters of the law. These are very, very powerful messages, and we have a, a few audio CDs back there. And then in my message, I'm going to try to talk you all into getting the habit of, of uh, giving people that you meet a Jesus loves you message and uh, we have two of these little powerful tracks the Lord put on my heart to start a track ministry and uh, I'll talk about those in my message but anyway they're back there at the table crystal will be helping you when I am praying for people and I'd be so honored if you got a little pack of 50 they're in packs of 50 uh, 10 cents a piece we sell them at printing cost we're not trying to make any money at all but I I just feel like uh, uh, well I won't preach my sermon now I'll, I'll get I'll preach it all right let's stand and we're gonna pray over the word today <clears throat> And there's so much in my heart on this subject that I want you to pray that God will take me over because I don't want to uh, 
there's almost no way I can order notes. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We want to please your heart by feeling what you feel and, uh, and uh, taking on the mission that is your mission. As you look at people that are lost, you care for them. You pay this huge, infinite price for their souls. We want to be uh, with you in that, uh, participants with you. And Lord, we want to see uh, a vast spiritual harvest, uh, locally, regionally, nationally, and internationally. We want to be a part of that. We want you to renew our passion for the gospel and for proclaiming that Jesus, that God loves people, that Jesus is the Christ, that salvation is a free gift. And uh, so we pray you'll do all of that today <clears throat> and continue to do it. Surround us with a great guard of wonderful warrior angels so nothing can hinder and dear uh, wonderful ministering angels by each one of us to help us receive and retain your word. Father, I pray you take me over by the power of your spirit and uh, we vow to give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Let's say his name together in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you as you're seated. <coughs> I want to I want to speak to you about proclaiming the gospel. Now there's two um, uh, different versions of the great commission. And one is in Mark in Mark 16 and one is in Matthew 28. They're a little bit different. So in Mark, Jesus said to them, "Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to every creature." or to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they'll cast out demons, they'll speak in new tongues, they'll pick up serpents with their hands, and if they drink any deadly poison it will not hurt them. They'll lay hands on the sick and they will recover. And uh, then Jesus was taken up into heaven and they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by accompanying signs. We don't uh, purposely pick up snakes in our hands, but I heard about a missionary that saw that a big poisonous snake had crawled into the crib with her little baby. And she stood on that verse and picked the snake up and took it outside and uh, it didn't bite her or the baby. Amen. So we don't have to be ashamed of that verse, uh, of any part of that verse. Amen. It's in there for a reason. But, uh, you know, Jesus, in the King James, it says, preach the gospel to every creature. Proclaim the gospel to every creature. So some people are like creatures. We don't uh, preach to the raccoons or the coyotes. <laughs> But how many of you have ever known a person that was stubborn as a mule, <laughs> dumb as an ox, <laughs> wily as a fox? Huh? You see, and that's what Jesus is talking about because you can see some people and you think, oh, that guy, guy, no use messing around with that crazy guy. Well, is he a creature? Yeah, he's one of the, he'd be one of the ones, he or she. All right, now in Matthew, he came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Uh, baptize him in, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now proclaiming is planting seeds. See, Mark's talking about proclaiming, and listen carefully, that has to be done outside the four walls of the church. Matthew 28 is the call to disciple the people that sprout, and we do that inside the church. We teach them to obey everything that Jesus has commanded. Now, what happens to us, the, the devil will try to get us only focused on teaching and making disciples to where everything that we do is within the church and there's almost no proclaiming the gospel outside. And we say, well, well, the radio preachers preach it. Well, the, no, I'm talking about you. I'm talking about what you do. Hello? 
Yeah, I'm talking about what you do, see. You say, well, when I teach Sunday school, I have a class with the boys and girls. I work in the nursery. I, I do, I disciple people, and I know, but that's within the four walls of the church. Now, what the Lord wants us to do is to realize that we can get so churchy that we no longer proclaim the gospel outside of the four walls of the church, and God has just been stirring me. Uh, and uh, renewing my passion to tell the wonderful news of salvation. You know, when Jesus went up to heaven after he told him, go proclaim the gospel to every creature, they went out and preached everywhere. Who was they? Just the church. I mean, you know, out of the 120 that got filled with the Spirit, there was only 12 full-time preachers. They replaced uh, Matthias, or the, with Judas was replaced by Matthias. 108 of them were regular folk. Hello. I see the Bible says apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists, we're supposed to train the saints to do the work of the ministry. Put your hand over your heart and say, I'm a minister too. Come on. Say it out loud. Come on. I'm a minister too. That's right. If I had a big pizza business and I've made the best pizza in the world and I wanted to advance my business, I'd have to train people to make pizza the same way I do. Then it could be multiplied. So if you see Peter doing something or Paul doing something or Stephen doing something, you're supposed to say, well, I'm supposed to be trained to, to do that. Lift your hands and worship God right now because the devil would like to keep you in the dark as to your own value, your own, oh, what, see, and that's why Paul said, I'm praying that the eyes of your heart will be opened so you know the hope of your calling and the incomparably great power for us who believe. And he didn't say for me who believe, he said for us. Incomparably great power. Lift your hands and worship God. God wants to bring his power, his anointing, his love, his wisdom, his compassion, and all that he is upon his body, not just uh, a few, uh, but the whole body of Christ. Praise God. And then he wants his church to plant and to water. Now, proclaiming the gospel outside of the church is where you plant the seeds. Teaching is watering. Amen? And after the thing sprouts, how I many of you know you've got to water it or it'll, it'll die, right? And it's going to continue to need water, water. So there's a lot of watering going on, uh, you know, a lot of discipling, a lot of feeding, nurturing. But if we don't plant the seed we'll become irrelevant. Now, I had a, a, a God uh, showed me what insight is. Insight is a, a certain form of wisdom that takes knowledge from one area and is able to apply it to another area. So the Bible says Solomon had insight just like the ocean. And so he spoke about plants and trees and fish and birds. What does that mean? That means he's taking knowledge from them and applying it to other areas. And so the Lord uh, gave me a little bit of insight. <laughs> I had a strange thing happen. We, uh, we had a bad grass, annual Kentucky bluegrass, took over a big part of my lawn, and I had it sprayed, and we put a couple thousand dollars in and put all new dirt and all new grass, front and backyard, just had a beautiful yard for one year. And then the, then the landscaping company that was uh, supposed to mow and trim, they did not put on a pre-emergent in February. And so that annual Kentucky bluegrass came back with a vengeance. And then they didn't put down any grub killers. And the crane fly is that big, what they call a mosquito eater. Uh, it's a big kind of floppy bird that looks like a daddy long's legs spider with wings. And, uh, and they invaded my front lawn and I didn't know that they had just sown their eggs so that grubs were eating the roots off of all the good grass. And the lawn just got thinner and thinner and thinner. And I finally dug up a big chunk and took it to a garden center. And he says, well, I don't know what's the matter with this, but it hardly has any roots. 
he didn't tell me what to do. So one day I drove into the driveway and a flock of starlings flew in. And starlings are, look like kind of like a blackbird and they have a banana colored bill about that long. You can always tell a starling, they get the yellow bill. And man, they'd only hop about two inches and then they drive their bill down into the ground and they'd bring up a grub and then chomp it and swallow it. And then they'd just go about over two inches and get another one. And after they left, it looked like my lawn had been aerated. <laughs> and so I realized then that the lawn was just full of grubs. And so I had to put on two different applications to finally get the grubs killed. Now the birds had been eating other kinds of grass seed. So not only did they get the grubs, but they replanted the lawn with a bad kind of grass. <laughs> And so I've, I've uh, uh, you know, I've, I've noticed, I, I know what turf wars mean. Have you ever heard of turf wars? <laughs> Grasses and weeds are having wars to compete to see who will take over. And I noticed that in nature, what wins is what is, it's got to win by its seed. And if it doesn't produce seed, it'll be extinct. It'll go out. Now, how many of you know, ever seen a dandelion flower that did not go to seed? No, you, you see a dandelion flower, you know that within a couple days, just two or three days, that thing's going to be a nice round ball of seed, all with its little parachutes, so it's going to blow out there. And uh, dandelions are successful because why? They're so good at going to seed. Now, I believe America needs to be reseeded, and from that, I, I realize that we not only need to plant seed, we need grub killer messages. <laughs> And a grub killer message is when we destroy things like evolution that's been eating the roots out from under Christianity in our country. So I'm, I'm, I have a new tract. Tract uh, ideas are just coming to me one after another, but I, I have one called the Creation Play where uh, it's going to feature young people, like maybe a 12-year-old type, maybe barely a teen, uh, and he, he would have an arrowhead in his hand and say, look, I, I found this sharp, f funny rock with all these sharp edges, and the professor would say, that's an arrowhead. That's, oh, no, and the little kid will say, I'm sure that the forces of evolution made this. The ocean picked up this rock and slammed it against other rocks until it got sharp like this, and the professor will say, don't be stupid. That's an artifact. That has to be made by the hand of man. Evolution for a trillion years could never make an arrowhead. It would round all the edges off. Look at the beach rocks. They're all round. <laughs> and then the kid's going to say, well, then if evolution couldn't make a simple arrowhead, how could evolution make the Indian that made the arrowhead with a brain and a heart and a liver and male and female and moves around? And then the kid's going to say, there must be a God. And I'd like to know him and be his friend. And see, that's very simple logic, right? But you give that to a kid and read that, and that's, that's scene one. Scene two is the girl comes home and says, I learned that we all evolved. And the dad said, that's right. She says, well, now that I know that, I'm not going to make my bed anymore. I'm going to let evolution make my room. <laughs> I'm going to leave the window open, and the forces of nature are going to organize my room. <laughs> and the dad's going to say, you could leave your window open for a trillion years, and your room is not going to get organized. You have to do that. The second law of thermodynamics says that if you have a system there, you have to inject organization from the outside. Otherwise, it'll always tend to disorder. And then the girl's going to say, well, then... There must be a great organizer that organized all this nature and that organized my body, and I'd like to know him and be his friend. See, I'm thinking of grub killer messages. <laughs> but it all boils down eventually to planting the seed that Jesus is the Christ, that he loves people. Now, the way I pass out tracts, I just go to people and I say, I have a little Jesus loves you message here. And I tell them, I wrote this. I, say, I just tell them, I wrote this. And it's all about how much. It's not about a certain church. It's just about how much God loves you. And I like to give them to people because I like people to know how much God loves them. 98% of the people thank me and take it and act like I've blessed them. 
because I'm real sincere. I'll just say, well, I, I'd like to give you the, and I can usually give two at a time. I, I give two, so I say, you know, these are two Jesus loves you messages, and if you read them, they'll really make you feel like God loves you. Now, how many of you think that's pretty simple stuff? But see, that's seed. That's proclaiming the gospel. Then when you give that to, you know, there was one guy at the uh, Office Max that has big long hair and he just looks like a transgender. I mean, he comes off extremely feminine. He could be a very masculine looking man, but he just looks so feminine. And I gave them to him and he was so grateful and thanked me and then just uh, uh, I think it was just yesterday I got some um, I went to the farmers uh, farmland store there in Cresswell to get something and and uh, I, I did my routine to this little girl and she said I haven't been to church in years I said well there's a good church just down the street that our family likes to go to and and she said, are they inclusive? And I said, well, if you were a bank robber and you came in with blood dripping off your hands, I don't know if they would, you know, welcome you. But she says, well, I'm, what about gay? And I said, well, all I know is that Jesus really, really loves you. She said, I'm half gay. And I didn't. <laughs> Half gay. I didn't try to argue with her or anything. It's just, well, well, I know that Jesus loves you, see? And she took it. She's reading it. So anyway, you know what's happening in my yard is I've been pulling up the bad stuff by hand. And then I put down the new seed, and then I cover it with uh, peat moss. And that's what we want to cover our seed with prayer that God will make it sprout. But it's so beautiful when the little sprouts come up and then when the whole area of the lawn is, is about that tall and it's starting to look like a real beautiful lawn again. And then I'm thinking, oh, America. America, you need to be reseeded with the gospel. And that means us. We're the people. We're the ones. So there's all kinds of different uh, ways to proclaim the gospel. I would love to be of assistance to you. I think giving people a tract is an easy way. And I believe it's effective. Now, people, some people will argue and they'll say, no, no, nobody looks at a tract. They'll all look at their phone. Well, you could download this one from my website and send it to people on your iPhone. We made it so you could do that. We even made a video out of it for 11 minutes. You can send an 11-minute video over the phone. But there's still something about in person saying, I'd like to give you a Jesus loves you message. And they're all illustrated. It costs thousands of dollars to make those with all that color art. Now, I remember a day that I was in Omaha and I had a track called You'd Make a Marvelous Christian, which we're just about ready to reprint with color and the people aren't all white. Nowadays, you have to have different races in there. So now we have a dark skin, brown skin, white skin, amen. <laughs> But I gave the tract, you'd make a marvelous Christian. The girl was a little blonde, a little young lady in her early 20s in a garden store. I had written my name and my phone number on the back. And uh, that was when I was lived in Omaha. And she uh, called me. She said, uh, uh, you gave me that tract that says you'd make a marvelous Christian. Well, I'm a Satanist, she said. I drink human blood. She said, I've got 10 spirit guides that were given to me in Indian ceremonies. She said, I, I have a spirit of divination. I can cast bones on the ground and tell people's fortune from the way the bones fall. And she says, do you think I'd make a marvelous Christian? I said, I know you'll make a marvelous Christian. <laughs> first thing came out of my mouth. I know you're going to make a marvelous Christian. Well, I ended up leading her to Christ. I ended up performing her marriage to another ex-Satanist who had been a child prostitute and flown all over America. You hear about stuff like that. Well, 
I actually met one of the young people that had been in that satanic network of child abuse. And anyway, he became her husband. Some people tell me, well, we only work through relationships, so we don't use tracks. But you see, I formed a relationship first by giving somebody a Jesus loves you message. Just lift your hands and worship God right now. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Now, I want to... Uh, the day I got saved, I was 13 years of age, and I got saved at a rancher's camp meeting in the Black Hills of South Dakota, and man, my pastor got a follow-up card. He made an appointment and tried to talk me out of salvation. He said, you've been hanging around the Baptist too much. You will outgrow this. You need to study psychology. The purpose of the church is to promote the arts. Yeah. I dropped out of church to stay saved. <laughs> I mean, I prayed for a year about getting saved, and when I got born again, I think I was filled with the Spirit simultaneously, because I was, I, I was raised in a certain kind of church where you never make noise unless the bulletin tells you what noise to make, you know, <laughs> and when to make it. <laughs> But oh, I wanted to roar in laughter. When I stood to receive Christ, he flooded into me. I probably would have spoken tongues if I'd have let it come out. But I went five years then without any discipleship. When I was a senior, I never told anybody I was born again. But when I was a senior in high school, two girls found out I was a Christian, and they said, we haven't done anything to win our school to Christ. Would you come to a prayer meeting at our house on Saturday? I agreed. And I drove into the driveway and they ran out to meet me with tears streaming down their cheeks and told me that our six A squad cheerleaders had just died in a plane crash. They came back from a basketball tournament in a private plane, tried to land in a crosswind. And the experienced pilot was a very experienced pilot, but he, he overestimated his ability and the gust of wind tipped the wing up and one wing hit and then the plane cartwheeled and burst into flames and the six most popular girls in a school of 2,000 students were swept out into eternity. And we had never shared our faith with them. Now, I became a soul winner, not because I had such great love for God or great love for people, but because I was so convicted of sin. I wept and cried and we repented that we had never shared our faith. You see, until you accept your responsibility, you'll space it. You'll never tell anybody anything. But the angels can't preach this gospel. That's why when the angel appeared to Cornelius, he said, go send a Joppa, get Simon Peter, he'll tell you words whereby you and your household will be saved. The angels can help us, but we're the ones that have the gospel. It's our responsibility, see? Now, I accepted that responsibility, and I had a lot of problems. Remember, I told you I went five years from 13 to 18, no discipleship. The devil really picked on me. By the time I was 18, I was oppressed. I had a lot of problems. I thought about suicide, and then I ruled that out. So the next thing, I thought, I'll run away and go insane. You say, why would you have to run away to go insane? It's personal preference, that's all. It's, I don't like to go insane around anybody that knows me, amen? So I thought I'd, I'd figured I'd run away somewhere, and then I'd go insane. But my third option was to get a miracle from God. That's when I began to read the Bible three hours a day. I'd be so troubled that I'd, I couldn't study at all. So I'd read the Bible for three hours until I found something that gave me hope. And then I'd, I pulled A's and B's by studying about an hour, an hour and a half at night. But then near the end of that year is March 17th. It was March 17th, 1968, when those cheerleaders died. That very day, that morning, that we had our first prayer meeting. 
And by the end of the school year, I had led 12 students to Christ. And when I flew back for the 50th reunion, I met three of them that were still living for God that were there at that reunion. But what I did is I got help. I got a pastor to show me some soul winning verses, made a little scripture chain, and I'd just sit down and show people John 3, 3. Unless you're born again, you can never see heaven. Unless you're born of the spirit, you can never enter heaven. And then I took them through several verses to Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in. And uh, I remember leading the editor of the high school paper to Christ in the journalism room. And she went home and swung her little brother around in circles for joy. And I met her 50 years later at the reunion, still a joyful Christian. Now, I want, I believe God wants, but I, I want too, to, for each of you to realize that you can do something that angels can't do. Uh, now, see, no matter who you are, you might think, I'm the littlest believer, I'm the littlest, I'm the shyest, I've got the most problems of any believer. Well, I had a bunch of problems too, but I wasn't telling people how great I was, I was trying to point them to Jesus, amen? And so you don't have to have your act all together, but put your hand over your heart and say, I can do something Michael can't do. Put your hand over your heart. Say it out loud. Say, I can do something Michael can't do. He's an archangel, by the way. Put your hand over your heart again. And say, I can do something Gabriel can't do. No, Gabriel is, can't preach the gospel. He can tell you what to say or line up an appointment. Now lift your hands and worship God. Just let that sink in and just think. You, boy, you got an important... Uh, important mission and so if you'll accept that and I, I accepted it and then uh, God just wonderfully began to help me so then one time I uh, when I first got into the ministry I was directing a choir, but after two weeks of directing a choir, I, something didn't feel right. So I said, Lord, what, what is my ministry? Am I supposed to study music? And he spoke to me and said, uh, your ministry here is primarily to be a soul winner. So at another prayer meeting, I said, how many souls can I believe you for? He spoke to me again and said, as many as the stars of the heavens. Now, if you ask him, how many can I believe you for? I believe he'd say the same thing. I didn't say, how many will I win? I said, how many can I believe you for? And he was saying, I'm not limiting you. Go for it. As many as the stars in the heavens, see? How many do you want to believe for? Amen? Have you ever decided how many you want to believe for? What if God said, how many do you want to believe for? Would you, what would you say? Well, I have a certain number in my head that I want to, I'm believing for, amen? <laughs> but then I said, how do I do that, Lord? I'm having trouble winning even one. And he said, start with little kids. They're the good ground of Matthew 13. And wow, that, that helped me get that bus ministry going in the 1970s. We led thousands of kids to Christ. Now, folks, listen to me. I'm not trying to follow the spirit here. Have you ladies uh, ever had a box of thread for your sewing kit? Raise your hand if you have some thread at home somewhere. Somewhere you do now. The, even the men know where the thread is. Even the men know where it is. All right. Now, how many of you know that you can't get that thread into any cloth without a what? Without a needle. All right. So everything you know about God is your box of thread. And you people know more than many of the pastors around the world. See, the native pastors around the world, many of them just don't know much about God at all, trying to run a church. So you, all, you have a big box of thread, but your method is your needle. And if you don't have a method, you can't get what you know into anybody. That's why the Jehovah Witnesses don't have the right thread but they have a method. The Mormons don't have the right thread. They're really good with their method. Amen? Amen. 
so they get what they believe into people. So I started saying a few years ago, I said, Lord, I'm just teaching and discipling, but I'm not winning enough souls. I, I want to win more souls. And I said, so I need a new needle. And then I said, no, wait, Lord, I don't want just a needle. I want a sewing machine. <laughs> And then I said, Lord, I don't want just one sewing machine. I want a bunch of them. Amen. <laughs> and since then, one of my sewing machines is to get this book into prisons. And then the tract ministry is another one. It's a good sewing machine. Amen. <laughs> so God will show you methods. And I hope he gives you more than one, and I hope that it works so well that it'll be like a sewing machine. Now, uh, there's wonderful benefits. I'll begin to close, all right? I'll begin to close, but I won't tell you how many closings I have. How about that? <laughs> Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you'll ask whatever you wish, and it'll be given to you. Okay, so if his word to go into all the world and proclaim the gospel and to make disciples, if that doesn't abide in us, then our prayers are not as effective. In Zechariah it says, I called to them, but they would not listen, so they called to me and I would not listen. So one of the, you know, when God called me to be a soul winner, I started winning all those kids, and several years went by, and the church became f well known because in Goshen, Oregon, the town only has 80 people. We were, at one point, I brought, uh, my crew and I brought in 810 people on the buses to a town of 80. And the pastor was flying around speaking at conventions. I felt left out, and I said, Lord, do you have anything else for me? I thought maybe he'd say, yes, I've called you to be an apostle, or yes, I've called you to be a prophet. But he said, yes, I'm calling you to be an intercessor. And then he taught me I'd have to be the sweetest person in the church, so I usually tell people, don't be a mean old ornery Pentecostal booger head. Amen. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, he called me to be a soul winner first and then an intercessor. Why not the other way around? I've always wondered that. In all these years, I've not had a proper explanation. But just recently, the Lord let me see John 15, 7 and 8, where it says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, then you can ask whatever you wish, you see. So when we let that great commission abide in us and we say, Lord, I want to feel what you feel for people and I want, to, I want to tell people that you love them. I want to bring somebody to you. That's going to help your prayer life. Amen. Does that make good sense? There'll be, there'll be personal benefit in there. But then there's also just a great benefit when you lead somebody to the Lord. It's just a, it's a wonderful thing. I remember one time that I led a team of two people. We went to visit a lady and... Uh, I said to her, have you come to the place in your spiritual life where you know for certain if you died, you'd go to heaven? She said, I know that if I died, I'd go straight to hell. And so we presented the gospel to her, and she prayed and received Jesus, and radiance broke out over her face, a glow, a glow. And I said, now if you died, where would you go? She said, I know now that I'd go right to heaven. And it was so sincere. And so when we walked out the door, I said, this gospel, I said to the people that were with me, this gospel is so glorious, I want to tell the whole world. Now, I'm 71, and I started noticing that on the food in the refrigerator, there's an expiration date. <laughs> How many of you ever noticed on the milk, it says, best used by... <laughs> And if it gets to that expiration date and it hasn't been used, then typically it gets thrown out. And so I used to think I want to bring God massive glory, so that means I need to live till I'm 140 because it's taken me so long to bring him massive glory. <laughs> but now all I want to do is get used up before my expiration date. 
I don't want to have there be books and creative stuff and callings and anointings and that doesn't get used. There is a date somewhere down the road where Wes is best used by. <laughs> Amen. And same with you. And I hope that each of you would say, Lord, I want to be all used up by the time my expiration. I want to, everything in my life, I want to be used by you. Just worship him right now. Just respond to him. Because he got a way to do wonderful things through each of you. Through each of you. And he created good works in advance for each of you to do. And he has several spiritual gifts for each of you. And each of you have a, a commission to do something that none of the angels, not even the seraphims, can do. Praise God. So these desires, the desires of the righteous are fully granted. And you want to just, even though you just say, I don't know how God could use me to do anything great. You know, I always ask that question. I say, I want to bring you massive glory. And I think, how could I... How could I do that? And then I think Jesus used five little loaves and two fish to feed 5,000 men plus all the women and children. And the fish were dead. <laughs> One time I said, Lord, these people in this camp meeting, they're expecting a miracle. And I am, I am a dead fish, I said. I, I was so depressed when I had to go preach that camp meeting. We were having so much trouble in our marriage that it was just, it was just awful. And I was supposed to preach a family camp. <laughs> and that's when I told the Lord, I said, I'm a dead fish. And then it came to me. You fed a multitude with dead fish before, Lord. <laughs> you got to do it again. I noticed that Samson picked up an old jawbone and slew a thousand enemy troops with it. How many of you can picture yourself being the old jawbone? or the little boy's lunch. Come on, lift your hand up. You might be little, you might be weak, but you know in Isaiah, God said, I'll make the weakest, uh, he said, I'll make the smallest a, a, a multitude of a thousand, but I'll take the weakest and make them a mighty nation. Now lift your hands and, and just think, uh, God uh, used to, he, he spit on some dirt and made mud and put it on the blind man's eyes. I could be the mud. I could be the jawbone. I could be the little lunch. And that's why the Bible says, you see, the Lord worked with them. They went out and proclaimed the word, but the Lord worked with them. And signs followed. One day when I was handing out bus flyers, I said, where's your mama? The little kid said, she got run over by a car. I went up to the hospital and she was blinded by the accident and three doctors had told her she'd never walk again. I remember I must have prayed for her in Jesus' name because when I walked out of the room, God opened her eyes and she said, if Jesus can heal my eyes, he can help me walk again. And I saw her climb Autzen Stadium where they played Ducks football from the bottom to the top. Now, I, I didn't have any special healing anointing in those days. At the close of this service, I'd be honored to pray for you because now I do have healing anointing since... July of 1991, I've carried a tangible, fiery anointing in my hands. I've most often seen knees and backs and hips and shoulders, anything to do with bones, uh, very, very commonly healed by a lot of other things. And, and the Lord told me to go ahead and tell people that, not to draw attention to myself, but to help people have faith. And then I pray for people to get used in gifts of healing. But I didn't have any gifts of healing at all that I knew of. I didn't have any special anointing for that. The Lord worked with me. Now, you can be used to do a miracle like that, you see, because you just tell people that Jesus is the answer, that he's God in human form, that he died for their sins, that he rose from the dead. And then be ready to pray for them, although it may look like the most impossible situation, and the Lord will work with you. Would you just lift your hands and worship him right now? The Lord will work with you, and he'll confirm that word with wonderful signs. And that's why I, I recommend, you know, when you have a church service, 
um, I don't know what your practice is, but I, I, I love to see somebody say, you know, at the close of our service, we want to give God an opportunity to do powerful things. No matter what your need is, we have some people that would love to pray for you, for God to do the impossible. And give God an opportunity, and let's give him an opportunity uh, to do great things. And praise in the name of Jesus. <clears throat> All right, I think I'm at my last closing now, okay? Uh, I, uh, I, I would always say to the little kids, uh, go get your dad, uh, and, and they'd go get this guy named Carl, who was a raging alcoholic. And I'd say, Carl, when are you coming to church with us? He'd say, I'm never coming to church with you. And each week when I'd bring the bus flyer by on Saturday to prime them to get ready to come on Sunday, I'd, I'd tell them the memory verse, what their be good treat would be, what the lesson would be about. I'd say, I sure want to see you come on the bus now. Uh, where's your dad? Go get Carl. Carl would come out and every week after week I'd say, hey, Carl, when are you coming to church with us? And one day I said, go get your dad. Carl came out and I said, hi, Carl, when are you coming to church with us? He says, come in here. I want to talk to you. He said, I saw you walking down the sidewalk and I thought he is not going to ask me to come to church again because he knows that I'm never going to come to church. He looked me in the eye and he says, and what's, what's more, I know that you know that I'm never going to come to church and yet you ask me anyway. I thought he was going to really blow up at me. And then he said these words. When he said, you, but you ask me anyway, he said, that makes me feel like you really love me. I know that you know that I'm never coming to church, and yet you ask me. That makes me feel like you really love me. I see Carl eventually came to church the last time I saw him he was in the hospital he tried to commit suicide and I was moving away at, at the time so I don't know the end of the story but when you tell people I want to give you Jesus loves you I pull into the service station and I ask him have I already given you my Jesus loves you message I say, yeah you already you already gave me I want to say you gave me that one but not that one I said well here have this one amen and I say have I given them to you yet he says yeah you gave them both to us I said well did you read them well no not yet I said well here have some more be sure to read them <laughs> And then when they say, yeah, I got both of them, and I read them both, I say, good, I'm working on a third one. Amen? I'm working on a third one. Now, what am I doing? I'm saying, I'm letting them know I really love them. Now, how many know you can do that? You see, a lot of times ministry doesn't have to be spectacular to be supernatural. It's not spectacular to give somebody a little tract and say, Jesus loves you. But it is supernatural. Thank you, Lord. I believe that's my message today. Can we just uh, look up to heaven right now? Praise the name of Jesus. Why don't we just adopt a, a worship, uh, not uh, bow your head in shame, but lift your head up like... You love the Lord. Maybe just lift your hands up and, and just tell the Lord. Uh, I always tell him, I'd like to feel what you feel for people, Lord. I'd like to feel what you feel for people. And I say, Lord, I, I want to I wanna be used. I don't want anybody to go to hell and be lost forever. So, Jesus, line it up to where I run into somebody today. I went to the Les Schwab tire store, had my tires rotated on my wife's car, and I gave a man there these two tracks and he said I'm so thankful you're giving these to me he said uh, my grandmother was dying 
and she should have died days ago, but she hung on and hung on and hung on and hung on. And finally, I called a, a, a chaplain to come over to the house. And he went in and, and prayed with her. And then she died real peacefully. And she sa he said, that really shook me up. Now see, it was just a, a God appointment for me to give him those salvation things. Thank you, Jesus. Let's thank God that he's going to use us. He's going to use us. He's going to give us fruit. The seeds are going to sprout. Hallelujah. And we don't have to give up on America. We just have to recede America. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah to Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's just praise him. Father, thank you. Thank you that you have saved us by your great gospel. And then we get to be participants with you in the great, great commission. We want to plant and we want to water. We want to proclaim and we want to disciple. Hallelujah. We want to be soul winners. We want to be intercessors. And most of all, we want to live a life of love. So, I believe you're stirring our hearts, and I ask you to keep stirring our hearts. I ask you to make us aware of, of, of everybody we see so that we wonder. I wonder if that person knows how much God loves them. I wonder if that person's saved. I, I wonder if that person needs to hear the message. Just make us aware. And, Lord, uh, we believe that you are... Uh, softening up people and preparing people and all the COVID stuff has got people to be way more receptive somehow. You've been working on their receptivity and uh, you've got it all set up for us. I believe that and I want to take advantage of that. I want to I want to connect with the receptive people. And, and I, I'm not a, a judge to know who is receptive and who isn't. It's just to say, I'll cast the seed on everywhere. Whether it lands on the road or the rocks or the weeds or the good ground will be entirely up to you. But I'm going to scatter the seed. Oh, hallelujah. And Lord, what a joy we will have when we get to heaven and we brought somebody else with us. Praise God.